at our household anyway. I think when Michael and Sandra first moved there, they had no idea how often people would just stop by. And that's okay. We don't ever mind that unless it's 2 o'clock in the morning. Then if you, uh, I would encourage you to find some other time to stop by. But, uh, still, we, we have folks come by all the time. Sometimes they bring gifts. Sometimes they won't gifts. So, but we have folks stop by. And that's okay. But we have uh, we've had a busy week, and we're going to take a week in August before school starts and go to the beach. And if you call me, it better be an emergency. <laughs> But if it is, you call me. Don't you hesitate. It's not that far away. So. Wow. I'm talking to my brother Roe. Is he still, there he is. Now, I'm sorry to shake your hand this morning. but uh, He said, where are you going to go when you finish 2 Thessalonians? And I told him, well, I think what I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago. I don't know. <laughs> but we'll figure it out when we get there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going, to con we're going to continue working our way through this last chapter. We'll be in verses 3, 4, and 5 this morning as we look at the faithfulness of God. Uh, that seems to jump out at us when we read this passage, beginning with verse 3 down to verse 5 of chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians. But the Lord is faithful. Glad to hear that. Who will establish you and guard you from the evil one? And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage. I pray you would help us see how faithful you have been and will be to us. Bless our time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When we dig into any of the letters of Paul, and there's quite a few in the New Testament, we find out that he says much about what we are to do in our walk with Christ. And if you have studied just one of Paul's letters any time, you find out it can get overwhelming because of the amount of information given to us. When I think of the book of Romans, the amount of information in that one letter. Well, as a matter of fact, Donald Gray Barnhouse preached from the book of Romans for 20 years. Now, I'm not saying he preached the book of Romans, but he preached from it. And uh, the point is, there's, and that's not the only one. Ephesians, Galatians, and on and on it goes. We're told to pray, study, worship, love one another, witness, be faithful to God, our brothers and sisters. We're told to do all of these things and much more. And when we do these things, and oftentimes we don't, what can we expect from God? He asks us to do all these things, but what help does he give? Paul answers these questions in this, this text right before us. He shows how God helps the believer as his commands are followed. If we think hard about this, we might be able to remember when God did something for us that was not expected. He might have protected us from an accident or kept us from getting sick or something like that. Because you see, he has a purpose for what he does and what he allows to happen to us. Jesus told his disciples that when they were busy doing the job of making disciples, he would be with them. And that has never changed. It's not an idle promise. And I'm sure you have had thoughts before of, of why is it that, why does God not keep us from more bad things happening to us, but then we forget that we're supposed to be about doing his business. Because if you're not doing anything for the kingdom of God, why complain if bad things keep happening to you? I've heard church members say, well, we can't give because we don't make enough money, but we'll do things at the church and that will be our tithe. 
Does the Bible agree with that? No. It doesn't. Bring you all the works into the storehouse or bring you all the tithes into the storehouse. It takes money to run a church, whether we like it or not. And it's easy to tip God rather than depend on him every day to take care of us. The woman who gave the small amount that day on the Sabbath day gave all she had. And Jesus called the disciples and said, you see that lady? She gave more than everybody else put together. How could you say that? Because she gave everything she had. She had faith that God would provide. So if God is faithful to us, why can we not be faithful to him? That is the glaring question. And so why would Paul in this passage say that God is faithful? Because the previous verse, if you remember last week, says that not all have faith, or not all can be found faithful. So God is faithful in doing five actions for believers who are actively working for the kingdom. And I will say that more than one time. Actively working for the kingdom. If you're not actively working for the kingdom, then these five you will probably never see. If you are, I think you will. So if you're about the Father's business, you will experience these five. If not, well, you'll experience the discipline of God instead. He'll get you where he wants you to be, whether you like it or not. Didn't you appreciate that about your parents? There were many times my parents disciplined me, and I didn't like it. They did it anyway. They didn't even ask if it was okay. <laughs> Let's examine these five actions by our Lord, and I pray we will work to experience all five. Number one, the Lord will establish the working believer. You see that in verse 3, the first part. But Paul begins that by saying the Lord is faithful. This is a concept found throughout the New Testament. I will give you just a few places. There's many others. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. No temptation has taken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now listen closely to what I'm about to say. This verse does not say that God will never put more on you than you can handle. That is a common misconception. That's foolish to even say something like that and read the Word of God. You say, well, Brother Keith, why do you say that? Well, first of all, it has to do with temptations, not trials. When you're being tempted, the apostle tells the church, look for a way out. Ask God for a way out. When you're being tempted, not when you're being tested. James says, don't look for a way out when you're being tested. Because if you do, you're going to miss what he has for you. God is faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But will with the temptation give you a way of escape that you may be able to bear it? Sometimes that way of escape is to run. You say, wait a minute, Brother Keith, I'm too old to run. No, you're not. If a bear gets after you, you're going to run. And there's times when we're being tempted, we need to get away from what's tempting us. Rather than staying there and saying, well, I think the Lord will help me handle this. No, you get away from it. Paul says, flee fornication. That's a very strong temptation, folks. And he means get away from it. Hebrews 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession or profession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You say, well, what's he faithful to do? 
Well, if you read the context, you find out. He helps us to stand when everyone around us is falling. Without wavering, he says. And there's times in this world in which we live that we don't need to waver. Waffle, you know. Don't know which leaf. Well, you're like a chameleon. You've turned whatever color leaf you land on. That's not a good way to be. And then 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful and just. See, God just doesn't wipe our sins away because he's God. Because if he did that, he would be unjust. But he wipes our sins away because somebody pays for it. Someone gives their life for our sins. And we have none to account for. I've heard people say, well, when I stand before the Lord and tell him about all of these things, now he, doesn't, he knows what you've done and what you are doing and what you will do. But if you are a child of God, if you have experienced the grace of God through Jesus Christ, Folks, when you stand before God, you will have no sin to account for. He said not guilty, and he meant it. He is faithful to perform all that he has promised, and I am not even scratching the surface of this idea of God's faithfulness. But let's go on. That's not what Paul's point was. He is faithful to what? To establish the word means to confirm or strengthen. And it is in the second person plural. He's talking to the church. He's not talking to an individual. He's talking to the church. It's very important for us to see that. And this church, if you read earlier in this letter and in the first letter, you find out this church was working, actively working for the kingdom of God. So all of those who were working for the kingdom, God would be faithful to establish, to confirm, to strengthen. So though only those who work hard for the kingdom will be strengthened. This promise is for workers, not slackers. We pick this up from verses 6 to 10, and we'll get there, Lord willing, later. But number two, He's faithful to establish, but he's also faithful to do what? He's faithful to guard the working believer. You see that in the second part of verse 3. Who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. This is a precious promise to the church, for the church. This verb, however, appears in the third person singular, which means that God is doing the work. You and I don't. We receive it. It's the work of God. He is doing the protecting as we work for him. Kind of reminds you of Nehemiah, doesn't it? You remember what Nehemiah had his workers do? Because of the danger of people coming in there and stopping the work of rebuilding the wall, he said work with a tool in one hand and a sword in the other. And as we read the book, what's interesting, they never had to use their sword, did they? Never had to. God was at work behind the scenes protecting the work. And when you're doing the work, until the work is done, God will be there protecting you. You say, well, wait a minute, Brother Keith. There's been many times I haven't been protected. Were you doing the work of the kingdom? Or not? And I'm not saying we have to go around 24 hours a day walking on our knees, praying, and that sort of thing. You know better than that. God expects us to live our life. But live our lives according to what he tells us in his word. When you ask the question, well, does God do this today? Does he protect us today? Yes, he does. When we're working for him. Do you realize in the Old Testament 
and in the New Testament, but God never called somebody who was idle. Never. Amos was plowing. How did God call him? Stop plowing and do what I tell you to do. I guess he left them right there in the field. David. <clears throat> what happened with David, who later became the king of Israel? His brothers were all paraded before the prophet or the Samuel, and Samuel said, no, the Lord says this is not one of them. Do you have another son? And Jesse said, well, yeah, he's the youngest, and he's keeping sheep. Bring him. That's the one. Moses, when he ran from Pharaoh because of killing that Egyptian, he was scared to death. Kind of remind you of the proverb that said, the wicked flee when no one pursues. But he probably had a reason to flee. But anyway, he got on the back side of the desert and fell in with Jethro, married one of Jethro's daughter, and he's keeping sheep one day, and he looks up on the side of the mountain, and there is a tree or a bush that's on fire, and he watches it. Because normally, it burns up. But this one doesn't. Moses, probably like most of us, well, I'm going to get a little closer and find out what's going on here. And when he gets close to this bush, God speaks to him and says, take off your shoes. You're on the holy ground. I want you to go back to Egypt and leave my people out. You want me to do what? <laughs> you can read all about his excuses there. We get over to the New Testament. Saul, who later became Paul. We often think, well, he was sitting somewhere when God, no, he was busily going after Christians to arrest them, possibly even see them be killed. He was busy doing something. I'm not going to say it was the best thing, but God called him and Jesus called him, and you know the story about that. But think about the disciples. I don't know who your favorite disciples were. I kind of gravitate to Peter and John because Peter, when I look in the mirror some mornings, I see Peter looking back at me. He was a, well, he didn't know how to connect his head with his mouth sometimes, and they got away from him. And then I think of the two co-workers with Peter and John Peter, James, and John, the two sons of thunder. That's an interesting name. I don't know if you know anyone that's been nicknamed that. But what were they doing when Jesus called them? They were with their father. They were tending or they were mending nets. As a matter of fact, Peter and Andrew, who were brothers, were fishing when Jesus called them. Do you see a pattern? God protects his workers until their work is through. You see that when you read Fox's Book of Martyrs. I have another book written uh, by another author that's written all the way up until the year 2000 called Christian Martyrs of the World. And it covers all the way up to the year 2000. And you would be shocked to know how many people have given their lives for the cause of Christ up to the year 2000. Well, you can read the book if you want. God protects his workers until their work is through. So until your work is through, you are invincible. That does not mean if you see a log truck coming, you can walk out in front of it. No, it doesn't mean that. But God will protect you until your work is through. There's no doubt about that. And then what happens? Well, he takes them to their eternal home. 
I always, I've got a book of illustrations, and one of the illustrations in there that always just got me, it gets me real good when you even around think about it. Old man and the Lord were walking together. They walked together every evening, and he would tell the Lord all the things about his family, his life, his job. And one day they were walking, and it got late, and the Lord said, Look, we're closer to my house than yours. Come on home with me. And that's what he did. But let's go on. Number three, the Lord will help the working believer obey. You see that in verse four. You see, Paul had confidence in the Lord. Two things for this church. Number one, that they would do the work of the Lord. Number two, that they would continue to do the work of the Lord. Now, where did they get their instructions to do the work of the Lord? From the weeks that Paul spent there, from his letters. The universal church approved the letters of Paul as Scripture. Peter even calls Paul's letters Scripture. He ought to know. And if the universal church, and when I say universal church, I'm talking about scattered all over the world. If they approve the letters of Paul as Scripture, this means that God approves them. We need nothing more, and we need nothing else. You have the completed Word of God in your hands. There will never be another book added to it. We don't need it. We have everything we need right in front of us. So not only Paul's letters, but from his instruction while he was among them. Paul asked him to remember what he said more than one time. He would say, do you remember? Do you remember when I was there? Do you remember what we said about that? And they would remember his exact words because Paul was inspired by God to write them down, as were the other writers of Scripture. I've had people tell me, well, I was inspired to write a poem. No, you weren't. The word inspiration in the original language means God breathed. And I don't think God breathed into you to write a poem. He only did that for the writers of Scripture. Now, we can be motivated to write a poem or something like that. I've written some myself, and I don't, I wouldn't give you a, I would probably give you a D if you gave me one of my poems. But my mother thinks there's something else. <laughs> and I'll say something that may get your attention. I hope it does. It's much more difficult to do the work of God while you're disobedient. It's much more difficult to do the work of God while you're disobedient. You say, well, wait a minute. Is that even possible? Well, I'm, what I'm talking about is to obey in public, but to disobey in private. In this manner, we can tell who is obedient in private because so many want to know what the will of God is for their lives. I remember in a, a Sunday morning in the church I grew up in, the, most of the deacons took the offering up and they would come forward. They would always uh, rotate. And one of the men prayed and he, he had to be in his middle 70s. And he said, Lord, show me what your will is. Folks, if you get 75 years old and don't know what the will of God for your life is, you've got some problems. You say, why is that? Well, let me tell you real quickly, and I'm going to do this as quickly as I can to help you understand what the will of God is. And it's not a place. It is not a place. The will of God is you. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Number one, are you saved? Do you know that when you close your eyes here, you will open them up in heaven and spend eternity there? Do you know that your sins have been forgiven by the blood of Christ? That's what I mean when I ask, are you saved? Number two, are you spirit-filled? You say, wait a minute, Brother Keith, we're not a Pentecostal church. I never said we are. But folks, if you're not indwelt by the Holy Spirit and filled by the Holy Spirit, then you, according to Paul in Romans chapter 8, are not one of his. You say, well, what do you mean when you say spirit-filled? 
I mean that you do what the Holy Spirit directs you to do as you read the Word of God. That's what I mean. Because the Spirit always empowers us to do the work when there's work to be done. Always. Number three, are you sanctified? Is the Holy Spirit working in you to make you more like Jesus Christ? Do you know that? Do you see His hand working in your life? And number four, are you submissive to Him? If the Bible tells you to dip snuff, then go ahead and do it. But it doesn't. <laughs> if the Bible changes your opinion about something, that's good. That's being submissive to Scripture. Don't be like the Mormon who put his finger on Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and said, I can honestly say I disagree with that because if you disagree with something in Scripture, you have the problem, not the Word of God. And the last one, are you suffering? And I don't mean have people threatened your life and said they're going to kill you if you don't quit talking about Jesus. They could. But are you suffering for the cause of Christ? There's all kinds of ways to suffer. When we speak up, people are going to say, what's wrong with that guy? What's wrong with that lady? Are you saved, spirit-filled, sanctified, submissive, and suffering? If you are, then do anything you want to. Yeah. Because if you're all of those things, you're only going to do what God wants you to do. That will be God's will. I had a fellow speak, well, I didn't, but the college I went to had a fellow speaking chapel one time and he said I've been on the mission field for 20 years and I was never called to be a missionary well I disagree if you can do that you obviously were called to do it that was God's will and you will notice too sometimes we go to college right out of high school I did. I went for a year. I got a couple of classes under my belt, and then I just gave it up because I, I didn't want to do it anymore. I just spent 12 years studying. I didn't want to do it anymore. And for quite a few years, up until I was in my late 40s, I didn't even consider going back to school. But when I went back, it was to get a degree in Bible, and that's what I wanted to do. Then. And the degree that I was working on was going to be architectural engineering. Could you see Keith Jones being an architectural engineer? Well, if Jesse was here, I'm sure he would say, no, I cannot see that. As a matter of fact, I had a Catholic nun for a professor in one of my classes at Hillsborough Community College. And one day, she, I think I might have told you this. One day she had every student in her class come up and say what their major was going to be, and she would give them some advice, and I went up and told her I was going to be architectural engineering, and she looked at me and said, are you kidding? I said, no. She said, do you want to spend all your life inside of an office? I said, well, no, not really. You might want to change your major. She was a super nice lady, Catholic or whatever. She was a nice lady, and pretty smart, too. Some people start out with you get a degree here and then what does God do? He changes that. Uh -huh. That's okay. Whatever, if you are saved, spirit-filled, sanctified, submissive, and suffering, then do whatever you want to do. But let's go on to number four. The Lord will cause the working believer to love God. And it's not just love God because this is an interpretation difficulty in the text. Is it to love God more or to love as God loves? Well, more than one commentator hold to the second, to love as God loves. No doubt this church in Thessalonica loved God. Their behavior showed that they loved God. Jesus said, didn't he, if you love me, you will do what? You will keep my commandments. And it seems from the context that the prayer of Paul for them was to love as God loves. 
For God so loved the world, we ought to pray to love as God loves. And you might ask the question, well, how does God love? And I'm going to give you a one-word answer, unconditionally. Aren't you glad about that? God doesn't wait until we clean our lives up and then start loving us. As a matter of fact, did he not say it through Jeremiah the prophet, I have loved you with an everlasting love? Even before you were created, God loved you. That's a pretty amazing fact. But we love him because he first loved us. Because it's not in us, is it, to love someone we cannot see. Those fellows on Mars Hill did not understand that. So they had all of these idols to this God and that goddess and this other one. And, all that, and Paul walks among them. It's almost like a cemetery with all of the headstones. And he gets to one and it's just a square probably that says in the Greek language to the unknown God. And the Spirit of God spoke to Paul's heart and said, use that because they don't know me. <laughs> And so God, uh, Paul preached to them the unknown God. We certainly need help to love as God loves. Sometimes, and I have to, my wife is helpful about this. She corrects me when I say what I think sometimes. I don't know, men, if you're like that. If you just say what you think. And you do know you're with her, and it's not going to go any further, but she knows there's a, well, that comes from inside. Is that what you think all the time? Not necessarily. But enough of that. Number five, the Lord will cause the working believer to have patience. Now, I know this just makes you light up with joy. The patience of Christ. Well, what is that? The, the original word is the idea of patient endurance, or we might call it perseverance. When you think of Jesus carrying his cross, or the cross piece, that's endurance, patient endurance. Because what did the writer of Hebrews say? He said he looked past the cross to what was on the other side. I'm going to tell you, it will not always be an easy job to serve God. People can be very difficult to work with. I'm thankful that nobody like that is in this church. <coughs> hmm. And the world is against the work of Jesus. If we don't know that, I don't know what to tell you. The world is anti-God and pro-themselves. It takes patient endurance to do the work. And when I think of that terminology and think about Jesus himself, Jesus was about his father's business all the time. At 12 years of age, when Mary and Joseph and probably a lot of family members and friends went to the temple in Jerusalem and they took Jesus with them. And when they left, obviously there were a lot of times Jesus would come up to Mary or Joseph and say, uh, this family wants me to go eat with them. Can I? Yes, you can go do that. And they started back home and didn't miss him for three days. They must have really been busy. And when they finally, oh, Mary was beside herself. we got to go back and find him. So they go back and where do they find him? Teaching the elders in the temple. And Mary kind of got home to him. And he says, Mother, didn't you realize I must be about my father's business? at 12 years of age. Now he was about his father's business all the time. We don't know anything about his 
early childhood other than what Scripture says. There's a lot of tradition. The Catholic Church says that uh, St. Christopher carried the baby Jesus across a waterfall. Or in fact, the word Christopher means Christ carrier. It's a good name. But if you're going to carry Christ, be careful what you say and what you do. But we ought to be about his business because this, even though we call this the church, these walls, the church is sitting in the church building. We're the church. And when we scatter, we're the church scattered. And we ought to be about our Father's business also because it's the same business. It's easy to see that. You say, well, why did Jesus perform all these miracles? He had people brought to him who were crippled and lame and demon-possessed and all this kind of stuff, and he would heal them. Folks, there's no indication in Scripture that Jesus healed everybody in Jerusalem. There's no indication of that. Why? Because he didn't. The miracles that he did were for one purpose, to draw a crowd to himself. And then what did he do? He taught them about the kingdom of God. And that has not changed. We're to still be doing that. John 5, verse 17, Jesus answered the Pharisees, My father has been working unto now, and I have been working. Both verbs working are in the present tense, present continuous. I have been, I still am. Jesus came to do the Father's will. Now let's apply that to you and me. Why did you come? Better be the same thing. I thought I was put on this earth to be a pest to some people. But no, that's not true. We're all put here for one reason, to do the Father's will. That's what Jesus did. <coughs> you say, well, Brother Keith, how do we know that that pleased God? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Scripture answers it. He answered it while Jesus was here. At least two times he opened heaven and said, What? This is my beloved Son in whom I am what? Well pleased. He's doing what I want him to do. Could Jesus do otherwise? He didn't want to do otherwise. But that's not the biggest how do we know what Jesus did please the Father? And I think you know. How do we know that Jesus' sacrifice pleased God? The question is, well, I'll go ahead and tell you the answer while you're thinking about it. The empty tomb. If Jesus had not pleased God, the tomb would be full. It's empty. And when you go over to Israel, and Brother Clark, I know you've been there, some of the others have, you can go to what they say is the tomb site. We're po not positive that's exactly where it was. And it really doesn't matter, because it doesn't matter where you go, you're not going to find his body. He has a glorified body. So Jesus, was his sacrifice was accepted by God and he proved that by raising him from the dead. That's why I don't like to use the terminology well I accepted Christ. No, God accepted Christ. I have no business even saying that. I'm going to use biblical terminology. I received Christ. I believed in him. That's biblical terminology. Five actions in these verses. Now remember, you can only experience them if you're already actively working or if you're planning to get active for the work of God. Because as I mentioned, God never calls someone who's idle. As a matter of fact, he said through the wisest man who ever lived, go to the ant, you lazy person, and consider her ways and be wise. My mother used to quote that to me. 
my dad never had that trouble. Because if he told me to do something and it didn't get done, I paid the price. I remember we had gone to my grandparents' house one time and I had slept in one room, my brother had slept in another, and my dad came in to get us up to do some work for grandpa, and he took his car keys and shook them in my ear. Now, I don't know if you've ever had that done to you, but I don't sleep very deeply, and that woke me right up. That was a whole lot better than what he could have done. You see, if you're not busy for the Lord, you will be busy for someone or something else. It'd probably be you. Jesus said, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad in Matthew 12, 30. It is a simple matter to discern if you are with Jesus or not. It's not difficult to do. It's your desire to be used by Him in any way He wants. If He tells you to leave tomorrow and go to Zimbabwe, Africa, are you willing to do it? If so, you're with Him. If it's not your desire to be used by Him in any way, then you're not with Him. It's that simple. And He's not with you. Because if you love Him, you're going to keep His commandments. You're going to do what he says. My prayer for all of us is that our desire will be to work until Jesus comes. And what did, what are we told in Scripture about Jesus or even God? His commandments are not burdensome. Folks, for the child of God, it should be second nature to do what God says. And yet we constantly have to pump ourselves up to do what we're supposed to do. You say, why is that? Because the remains of the sinful nature. You better be glad you don't have it all. Or like Cody Malcolm said, if we could lose our salvation, we would. And very quickly. So when he comes, I had a preacher tell me this when I was a kid. I didn't like it. You might not like it either. He said this. If you go to the movie theater and Jesus was to come back and find you at the movie theater, what would he think? And I said to myself, I have no idea what he would think. I have to get Keith out of the theater, I guess. But the, his point was we ought to be working for the Lord no matter where we go. I'm not saying we ought to go to the bar and try to reach people with the gospel because... People who are inebriated will sometimes do anything you ask them to do and they leave that place unchanged. <clears throat> but when he comes, will he find us working? Because if even in the United States, the fields are white under hearts. Jesus has not told us to go and win multitudes, has he? He said, go and get one. He left the 90 and 9 to go get the 1. We ought to do the same thing. But it's real easy for us as Southern Baptists and to say, oh, well, let's reach many, many, many people when that may not be what God has for us. It's like the boy walking along the beach throwing the starfish back into the water. And a fellow says, there's too many of them. You're not going to be able to get them all. And the boy bent over and picked one. That one liked it. <laughs> Can't get them all, but we can surely get some. And pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his field. And when we do that, that laborer might be us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. For this passage of scripture it tells us what you do but father there's always obligations on our part you don't do what you do without a purpose without a reason and it's always a good purpose or a good reason lord help us to see that the fields are white 
And when you look at the day in which Jesus lived and him telling that to his disciples, you might say, well, look to me like most of the Jews would resist what Jesus said. As a matter of fact, they put him on a cross. And then when the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter came along, they were both persecuted. Father Jesus did not tell us we wouldn't be persecuted. He just said the harvest is there. Go get it. And you will be with us. You won't leave us to do the work alone. You promised when you go and make disciples, I'll be with you. Help us to be about doing your business and no one else's business. And I realize that might sound like I'm saying, quit your job, give everything up. But that's not what you tell us, Father. You tell us basically, as you go, do the work. They're all over the place, and they need to hear the gospel. Help us take it to them. This we pray in Jesus' name.